Um, I always um, thank you, Karen. That was amazing. Really interesting to hear all the work that's gone on in the background. I always, when I hear you speak, I think we're really important. I come into my job every day and I think we have a really important service. We're doing a really important job and we're only a small cog in a very big wheel that is the HSE. And we wonder why we don't have funding and we wonder why we can't develop our own service. Um, so when, it, when I hear you speak, realise all the work that you're doing and then realise how hard it is to actually move forward. Um, it, always, it always resonates with me. Um, so I'm going to talk about preparation for bariatric surgery. This is my world. This is what I do all the time. And this is what we do. So I think I'd like to start off with saying, I know we've talked about the waiting list and Jean mentioned the waiting list earlier on. There is a very long waiting list to get to our service. When patients do get to our service, once they do get there, the waiting list then is about three years from surgery when they get to us. So a lot of patients feel when they're on the waiting list for the, wait, the level three service that they're on the waiting list for, they ring us while they're on the waiting list and they ask us when they're, where they are on the list for bariatric surgery. So it's really, really important to say that when they get put on the waiting list for our service, they're on the waiting list for the level three service, which is a year long program. Bariatric surgery comes up in that program. It's mentioned if it's a suitable treatment option for our patients, those patients are put forward for bariatric surgery and I will discuss that further. But it's really important to say that the waiting list is for the level three service. And then there is a waiting list again for, for bariatric surgery. We, put, we do about 70 to 80 surgeries per year um, and I'll discuss that as I go ahead. So what, are the, what I will talk about today are the eligibility criteria for bariatric surgery, contraindications and considerations for bariatric surgery, and preparation with the assistance of the MDT. So um, that is done through the level three service, and then again prior to bariatric surgery, and then pre-op medical investigations. So who is eligible for bariatric surgery? So while we heard Jean talk earlier on about BMI and how BMI shouldn't be a measure, um, or we, we shouldn't use BMI to um, identify um, obesity, with regard to bariatric surgery criteria, it is in the guidelines for criteria for who is eligible for surgery. So anybody who is over 18 with a BMI of over 35 with at least one or more obesity related comorbidity or anybody with a BMI of 40 or anybody with a BMI between 30 to 34 who've been refractory to non-surgical attempts at weight loss. So that um, can be unstable um, type two diabetes. So I just have a list here of the obesity co um, co related comorbidities. You probably know a lot of these already, um, but they're just the, the, the ones that we see in our clinic all the time and the ones that we will be seeing um, in your practice. So it's type two diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, polycystic ovary syndrome, um, intracranial hypertension, um, OHS, arthritis, NAFLD, NASH, um, coronary artery disease, severe reflux, and obstructive sleep apnea, which we'll talk about later. So the contraindications to bariatric surgery. Anybody who comes through our clinic, what happens about six months into the service, we have an MDT discussion um, and to see if bariatric surgery is a good treatment option for, our, for that particular patient. So everybody is assessed on an individual basis and it is um, the outright contraindications are unstable psychiatric illness, malignancy or other diseases associated with decreased life expectancy, substance abuse or inability to adhere, adhere to long-term follow-up. And these would be identified within the level three service um, and discussed. The patients are then informed of whether bariatric surgery is a suitable treatment option for them. So considerations, so advanced pa patient age is not a contraindication to bariatric surgery, but is, it is a consideration. So obviously, if bariatric surgery is gonna improve a patient's overall health, they would be um, considered for bariatric surgery to, no matter what age they are. And also um, liver disease is also, um, NAFLD and NASH um, are a consideration before surgery, but not an absolute, absolute contraindication. And co a consultation happens between endocrinologists here, surgeons, and the liver team, if necessary, prior to surgery. 
So preparation, patients need to engage in an educational process involved in, um, within the level three service prior to surgery. Treatment of potential long-term nutritional um, deficiencies needs to happen before surgery. Um, intervention of obesity-related complications or, um, um, or treatment of obesity-related complications um, prior to surgery. And then obviously assessment of mental health. During the level three service, um, behavior change is obviously um, very, very important. And that is a lot of what we do within the service. So every patient sees um, members of the MDT throughout the level three um, service and um, strategies such as mindful eating, goal setting and self-monitoring are, um, are major um, or I can think of the word there, um, skills that we will try to develop with patients. So I suppose in the guideline, I had used the um, Obesity Canada um, pre-op guidelines for this, and th the two things that were mentioned were the behavioural strategies for successful weight loss and weight maintenance, which I've already mentioned, and then I suppose exercise what we don't, Colin's going to kill me for focusing on exercise, but um, it is... Um, associated with um, weight loss post-surgery so obviously um, it is something to be um, mentioned. So as regards a psychosocial assessment prior to surgery so all our patients go through um, psycho um, assessment with a psychologist prior to surgery um, and they have if it's identified that they need extra surgery or extra sorry if it's identified that they need extra sessions with the psychologist or they need to be referred to the adult mental health services that's done at the level three service um, and that's just to make sure that any uh, any um, clear contraindications to surgery are identified or um, any strengths and vulnerabilities are highlighted so that there isn't any potential problems with mental health post bariatric surgery. So what happens prior to surgery? So we see our patients, they come in to us through the level three service. Unfortunately, with regards to the waiting list, when they're discharged after the level three service, they are discharged back to the care of their GP because they then go on a two year waiting list for bariatric surgery. So what we do then is we um, contact them about we like to say two to three months before surgery this can sometimes be six months before surgery um, and they come up to us and they have what we call a bariatric surgery screen so in that they see an endocrinologist they see a surgeon and um, they have an education session about bariatric surgery so that assessment is done because surgeries for us are done in St Vincent's Hospital and when a patient is sent over to St Vincent's Hospital for surgery they get the pre-op assessment the week before their surgery. So we want to have our patients screened and um, ready for surgery before they get to their pre-op assessment in Vincent's so that they, uh, there's no surprises at that pre-op assessment. So prior to surgery, patients are um, commenced on a low calorie diet um, before surgery and that's done two weeks before surgery. Um, and this is associated with decreased difficulty in performing surgery. Um, it minimizes blood loss, improves short-term weight loss and short-term complications and decreases operative time. So the two week um, pre-op diet prior to surgery is done for just short-term goal, just for those um, um, things that I've identified there. So with regard to pre-op, um, medical nutrition therapy. So patients living with obesity, we know that they have a higher risk of inadequate nutritional status and micronutrient deficiencies. So it's really important that these are identified and treated prior to surgery. Malnutrition prior to surgery has been associated with increased mortality and morbidity, increased readmission rate, and increased post-op nausea and vomiting. So at this pre-op screen that we do here, we do um, a full blood panel we do an FBC, renal, liver, lipid profile. We do um, TSH, iron studies, vitamin B12, folate, vitamin D, calcium, fasting glucose, and HbA1c. That's done on all patients. These bloods then are set, assessed, and then hopefully anything that needs to be treated is done prior to surgery. Um, just to, um, to take off note, patients taking proton pump inhibitors and or metformin have a higher prevalence of vitamin B12 deficiency. 
So pre-op optimization of micronutrients levels, especially vitamin D and vitamin B12 and iron is recommended prior to surgery. So if that's identified, obviously these patients are sent out of prescription before they have their bariatric surgery. Smoking is a really important one um, and has to be mentioned. So smoking before surgery is not recommended. We recommend the patient stop smoking at least six weeks before surgery. One study identified that smoking within one year, so smoking within one year of bariatric surgery had increased 30 day mortality rate, had um, resulted in major post-op complications such as um, wound healing and pulmonary complications, um, resulted in marginal ulceris, ulcerization, uh, or ulceration and bone fractures. So one study recommended in some surgeons say that smoking should be stopped at least a year before surgery. Here it's six weeks and it is an absolute no-no for surgery if somebody is smoking within that six weeks period. So can't have a lecture in these days without talking about COVID-19 and um, the, the impact that COVID-19 has on um, surgery for our patients. So we know this in the general population that COVID-19 in the pre-op period can increase risk of pulmonary complications, um, increased risk of blood clots, increased risk of 30-day mortality rate. Um, also, COVID-19 in the post-op period can increase risk of complications up to eight weeks following COVID-19 diagnosis, can increase pneumonia, respiratory failure. It's been associated with um, clots and sepsis. That's in the post-op period. So the best practice is that bariatric surgery should be delayed until at least eight weeks post COVID-19 diagnosis, which has made our lives a lot very difficult. We'll have screened patients for surgery, we'll have given them dates, and then they'll phone us and say that they're positive for COVID-19 and surgery is delayed. And there is no, um, we don't budge on that. So pre-op investigations, this is when this all gets a bit wordy and it becomes a list of um, things that patients need before surgery. Um, so cardiac evaluation, OGD, sleep assessment, medication review, um, baseline DEXA scan and stabilisation of blood sugars um, with type 1 and type 2 diabetes. And I have slides on these. So cardiac evaluation, um, the research would say that the gold standard of, for cardiac evaluation remains coronary um, angiography for um, pre-surgery. All our patients have an ECG done in St. Vincent's Hospital prior to surgery. Um, when they come to us for their cardiac, or when they come to us for their bariatric surgery screen, our patients then, anybody with any identified cardiac history, we get all their documentation from their um, cardiologists so that all that information is there prior to surgery and any tests that we need to order or um, echoes or anything are done pre-surgery so, um, so that we have a good idea of where the patients are at. OGD is performed on every surgery, um, every um, patient going for bariatric surgery as well. Um, and that's to diagnose or outrule hiatus hernia, esophagitis or Barrett's esophagitis, diseases such as palpitogal ulcer diseases or tumours, um, and also screening for H. pylori is recommended in patients undergoing gastric bypass um, due to increased risk of gastritis, palpitogal ulcer um, disease and gastric carcinoma. So all of our patients have an OGD prior to surgery. That um, workup is done here in St. Colm Kales Hospital. Previously, we had been sending our patients out to um, their local hospitals because obviously we have patients from all over the country. They're put on a waiting list in their local hospital and then surgery was delayed because obviously they weren't ur urgent after waiting for nearly seven years in our hospital. So this OGDs are done here. Sleep disordered breathing is a big one. Um, it's really, really important um, and every patient going for bariatric surgery needs to have had a sleep study and needs to be on CPAP treatment at least six weeks before surgery. So there was a study, and I know that the physios will talk about this as well later on, um, but and Katie will talk about this later. Um, there was a study done here in this hospital um, where um, patients with a mean BMI of 53, um, there, it, there was an overall prevalence of 91% of patients being diagnosed with sleep apnea, with 77% of them needing treatment with CPAP. So therefore, every patient that comes in through our clinic, um, level three service gets assessed for um, sleep apnea straight away. There, there is um, 
Epworth scores and Stopang um, uh, um, scores that can be done on the patients, but these are subjective. So we just um, send everybody for um, a sleep study. So patients with OSA undergoing bariatric surgery have um, a prolonged hospital stay, increased venous thrombosis, increased need for re-intervention and increased 30-day mortality rate after surgery. So therefore, it's very, very important. This is, um, this is what delays my job, having patients go for OGDs and making sure that they're on um, s- treatment for sleep apnea. A baseline DEXA scan is recommended for um, patients with um, so post-menopausal women, older men, patients with prior um, fragility fracture, patients with prior fragility factors and family history of osteoporosis. This is done because bone density decreases after um, bariatric surgery. So baseline DEXA scan is recommended pre-surgery and then two years post-surgery. So medical cons- con- considerations. Um, avoidance of aspirin is recommended prior to surgery. NSAIDs should be discontinued prior to surgery and their use is contraindicated post or AGB due to risk of um, ulcer. Um, so risk of thromboembolism after surgery, um, the 90-day incidence of venous thrombosis after bariatric surgery is not 0.42%. While this is relatively low, the consequences can, can be severe. So thrombo, um, so prophylaxis with INAHEP after surgery is recommended. So antiplatelet and anticoagulant medication will also um, require cessation prior to surgery and bridging heparin is often used. The use of DOEX after surgery, direct oral anticoagulants, is currently not recommended due to lack of evidence in this area. So some um, have been shown to be suitable, others have not. So therefore the recommendation is that they're not used after surgery. Vitamin K agonists such as warfarin are recommended. So medical considerations, there's more. <laughs> um, so immune modulating medications such as methotrexate may be held prior to surgery due to um, the fact that um, it can inc- it, um, it's an immune suppressant and can increase infection post-surgery. Medications dependent on absorption or in acid environments or long-acting medications need to be considered before surgery. So every medication that a patient is on um, needs to be assessed. Um, prior to surgery and discussed with the, um, their prescribing doctor. Oestrogen therapy needs to be discontinued, so um, the OCP needs to be stopped four weeks before surgery, HRT should be discontinued three weeks before surgery, and women are re- recommended to defer pregnancy until, um, until at least 12 to 18 months post bariatric surgery. And recommendation of a long-acting reversible contraceptive reception such as the um, on intrauterine coil is recommended after surgery and um, the OCP should be discontinued due to malabsorption. So pre-op management of diabetes, it's really important that diabetes is, um, unstable diabetes is made stable before surgery. So there has been some evidence to suggest that a target of less than 7% or 53 millimoles per litre of a HbA1c should be reached before surgery. This is sometimes impossible. Um, so this is um, just a suggested target. We know that our patients are susceptible to insulin resistance and this is often very difficult to achieve. So every case is assessed as as an individual basis. Um, And if blood sugars have to be um, made under control, they are assessed by us prior to surgery. One study did report that patients with HbA1c of greater than eight prior to gastric bypass were associated with increased post-op complications and decreased weight loss. So I've gone through a very extensive list of everything that somebody can do prior to surgery. I think I've gone through that quite fast. Is there any questions? Yes. What main replacement product is used for surgery for So here it's a food-based diet. It's a thousand-calorie diet. So, sorry, it's a, it's food. So it's not a meal replacement. Yeah. Sorry. It's food-based diet here, so it's not, we don't use meal, so in some places they use meal replacements, some people use milk. Here we use a food-based 1,000 calorie diet pre-op. Any other questions? Can, can 
can I ask her, because I, I know this is always tricky when you talked about it there, you know, the issue with if somebody has type 2 diabetes that isn't in great shape and, and trying to decide then how, how quick you can get it before surgery. And do, do you want to talk a little bit about that, the, the over <coughs> back, I suppose, with that? And so, yeah, it's it's back to self-monitoring patients then are encouraged to um, contact us weekly if not two weekly with their blood sugars it's a you've got somebody who's gone away from the level three service who's um, got unstable diabetes and now you're saying to them trying to get back to all that stuff that they learned when they were in the level three service their behavior change um, techniques that they learned when they were here to try and get them to, um, to a place where their hba1c um, it is decreased. This can take up to, as you all know, three months, could take even longer. Um, and it is with um, constant contact from us, so two weekly contact with us with their blood sugars and also with sorry, medication. I, sorry, I was just going to pop in and add, just because I'm conscious of the mic. Yeah. Um, just as well, because um, if we go back to the point that I was saying about where the risk of uh, not having surgery outweighs the risk of having the surgery. We do sometimes p put people forward with HbA1cs that are higher than the recommended cutoff because we can't, with all the intervention both on the part of the patient and us working closely with them, we can't get their diabetes into a really good range. We get it as good as we can get it and then we go ahead with the surgery because that patient needs the surgery. So I suppose that, that it's, it's, we have those goals but then having a flexibility as well. Sorry. Um, just in relation to the HbA1c, is there kind of an upward threshold for which you wouldn't operate on? So let's say if they came in and the HbA1c was 100 and it went down to 90, would, would that, is there a level that is uncomfortably high to operate yeah, on? Yeah, that's probably then? still too high. And I think we usually can get it better than that you know I mean with with because often when we're seeing people like Claire was saying they 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 haven't been with us for ages and then they um you know they they come to we see them a few months in advance of their date and now we can give them a lot of intervention so we can usually get it better but the cutoff like Claire was saying is about eight percent so you could probably accept a little bit higher than that maybe between eight and nine but we, we wouldn't want it to be higher than that You know, so they've finished the level three and they've done their program, and then is it taking away maybe up to three years? Yeah. Is there, you said they're discharged back to their GP, are they linked in with you guys in that three year period? No, or? not for any intervention okay. um, at all. No, so they are. Do they do see a surgeon within that time to decide on what type of surgery they're going to have and ODDs are ordered, um, but no. No, not until they come for the screen, and that's why we do the screen okay. so far out from surgery to try and identify anything that's happened since we've seen them last. And just from like behaviour change, you were saying they would have been on that year program, and you know the follow up. Yeah, there's just is there any plans? Kind of just think of all the details. So the in the ideal world, yeah. there'd be no waiting list. So in the ideal world, we would have somebody referred for the GP, yeah. they come to the level three service, and then they're straight into a level support service. So ideally, there would be no wait yeah. in between the two services, none. So I, I suppose, is there plans? Yes, that's what Karen's job is, to try and get these plans and get these things happening. And I think she talked about um, a, a, different, a different world in 10 years time, but mm. at the minute, that's what the, the overall plan is, that there would be no waiting list between those two services, that, yeah. that's... Just thinking of the interim where they discharge back to say their, I'm just thinking of all the new community posts, that they discharge back to their appropriate CHO for follow-up or support yeah. in that interim yeah. period. Back, back to their diabetes clinic, yeah. back to their cardiology clinic, yeah, yeah. But as I say, ideally there would be no waiting list. Thank you. Any other questions? I just like to put on there, just kind of that piece about the mental health kind of side yeah. piece in psychology. I was just wondering about what kind of things might be provided for patients. Because then getting into waiting lists is such a big issue. But I was wondering what kind of should be nearly provided in regards to mental health. So I suppose. <laughs> Ruth might go into that later on, would you? So I, I suppose in the community is the Adult Mental Health Services, which I know there's a waiting list for that as well. Um, we do provide um, group support for patients here. So pre and post-op, there is a group 
um, on a Tuesday that's done for the patients and anybody who is on the waiting list for surgery is, is can come to that group. Yeah, and that's kind of like what our support group is. I mean, they can just drop in to that, but obviously we're here and somebody could live in Cork. So they're not just going to drop in for a group. Do you know, that's the problem. Any questions? Yes. Um, just in terms of when someone comes out, so they've been waiting for bariatric surgery and then they come back for their um, pre op assessment, if they come back and then maybe they've restarted and kind of spoken and they've gained some weight, are they sent back to the start or are they kind of watched closely and given maybe six months to, to work at it again or what happens in that situation? So you've, you've mentioned two things there the smoking, that's one thing, and um, the weight gain makes no difference that doesn't matter as in that, that that to us that makes no difference so we didn't wouldn't even look at what a weight somebody is i suppose what we look at is their overall health is it impacting on their overall overall health how are they and then do they need extra psychology support do they need um so is is that because they're in a situation where they're um, in a crisis at home or something the smoking cessation is uh, obviously a different issue so um, we would recommend that they give up we'd recommend um, lozenges we'd recommend um, nicotine gum and um, certainly vaping is not recommended because um, there is no evidence to suggest that that is um, is any good but certainly it would be looking at every patient as an individual when they come in what do they need next and what do they need to get them to surgery so that's a whole different job in itself of this between the screen and getting them to bariatric surgery uh, so we would have loads of patients like that. That's pretty much what you've described. They've come back to us, we haven't seen them, and they're in a situation where they, they have in a different situation than they were when they left us in the level three service.